uh, I'd like to introduce Neha Narula from the uh, MIT Media Lab Digital Currency Initiative, who's going to be giving a talk on understanding Bitcoin's long-term economic security. Uh, let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to make sure the lanyard's on and not this mic. Yeah, it seems like it's working OK. Great. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Neha. Thank you all for coming to MIT today and to being here. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to give them lots of rounds of applause in the future. So I'll, I'll just get right to it before doing that. Um, so I am the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, which is based here at the Media Lab at MIT. And today I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin's long-term economic security. So Bitcoin relies on Nakamoto consensus. Um, and I, you know, if you look at coin market cap, you know, it's about $1.2 trillion of market cap depends on Nakamoto consensus, which is based on something called proof of work and heaviest chain, often colloquially known as longest chain. And it's the way that the network decides on what is the canonical ledger of transactions, who has what Bitcoin in the system. And the whole point of Nakamoto consensus is to guarantee that um, there are no double spends when a majority of the hash rate follows the protocol as specified in Nakamoto consensus. So just so we're all on the same page, I want to talk about what that means, what a double spend, what a double spend is. So just very simply, you and I might agree on an exchange of Bitcoin for, say, dollars. Uh, I broadcast a transaction sending you Bitcoin. You wait for K block confirmations, however many you want, uh, and then you uh, release the USD to me. So this is like a really important point. This is the point where you, you think that you definitively have the Bitcoin and it's safe to make this exchange of assets. Now, the attack is that I, in secret, create a heavier chain, which includes a transaction double spending the original Bitcoin outputs to an address under my control. The network will see this heavier chain, and because of the way Nakamoto consensus works, will happily reorganize and switch to this heavier chain. And as a result, I will have the USD and the Bitcoin. So I've conducted a double spend attack on you. So pretty straightforward. Hopefully this, this idea isn't new to anyone here. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the most pressing form of immediate attack on Bitcoin. It's, it's pretty hard to be able to do this in practice right now. But I am saying that if Bitcoin needs to do anything, <laughs> it needs to prevent this attack. This is kind of the entire point. Like we need to be pretty sure that this works, that, that, uh, that this attack can't happen. Otherwise, the whole thing kind of falls apart. Now, there are a lot of other ways for things to break in Bitcoin as well. Uh, for example, you know, some of the cryptographic functions might be broken. Um, there could be network partitioning attacks, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of the whole point of the protocol. This is like what we're all here for. This is what we signed up to do. So this sort of begs the question, well, OK, you know, Things seem to be working OK now. You don't hear about double spend attacks. But how do we know that they will continue to work in the future? You know, things might change. Electricity costs could change, or there could be new ASICs. Um, there could be you know, growing prices, different types of transaction usage. How do we even think about that, right? Like, how do we get, how do we convince ourselves that Nakamoto's consensus is going to continue working? So there's the historical evidence, so far so good. Um, you know, 15 years, that's not nothing, that's real. Um, but, uh, you know, there's the issue where the future might not resemble the past. Like I said, things, are, things might change. Uh, the block reward, the block subsidy in Bitcoin is going to go to zero. Uh, we're seeing larger and larger transactions and market cap. Uh, you know, as ASICs are developed, there's this old ASIC supply. It's going to be really interesting to see how that sort of plays out. And we can actually get some learnings from smaller coins that also use Nakamoto consensus and don't have quite as high of hash rate as uh, Bitcoin. And we've seen that those get attacked uh, actually quite a bit. There have been double spend attacks there. Um, so the ideal way of convincing ourselves that Nakamoto consensus will continue to work is to get an actual security proof, to get a proof under reasonable assumptions and a reasonable model that we all agree on that Nakamoto consensus is secure. And the good news is, 
that there are many awesome proofs, um, and you should uh, go off and read these. I, I didn't have space to list all of the papers, but there have been some really amazing, beautiful proofs and arguments for the security of Nakamoto consensus. Uh, but if that were the case, if that were it, then I would be done with my talk. Unfortunately, they all rely on the honest majority assumption. So what does that mean? They rely on the fact that we can assume that, an, uh, that a majority of the hash rate will not just behave rationally, but will behave honestly, meaning even if it is not in their rational interest, they will follow the protocol. That is the assumption that's required uh, for these security proofs. To the best of my knowledge, there is no proof that Nakamoto consensus is fully incentive compatible, that, um, that it's a Nash equilibrium to follow the protocol. We'd really like to get stronger than this. We'd like to have an argument that miners are incentivized to follow the protocol rather than relying on altruism, relying on them to be honest. So Satoshi you know, acknowledged this in the white paper. Um, they kind of had a hand wavy argument in the white paper. Uh, and they said that if a greedy attacker can assemble more, well, you know, CPU power at the time than all the honest nodes, he would have to choose between using it to defraud people or using it to generate new coins. And then the key line being, he ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules um, and uh, then to undermine the system and the validity of his own wealth. So there's this argument right there in the, um, in the white paper, uh, but it's not really very precise. <laughs> um, it's already a little suspect because it has the word CPU mining in it. And so how do we get any assurances that this will continue to work? How do we even begin to think about this problem? So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, some research that others have done uh, moving beyond the honest majority assumption and conducting a cost profit analysis of double spend attacks. Uh, I'm going to talk about ways to model the costs. And I'm also going to talk about some work that we've done at DCI to, um, to learn from what's happened in practice with other coins. I'll briefly touch on um, some theoretical work that we did considering other strategies that might mean that Bitcoin has more incentive compatibility than we thought. And I will also uh, preview some work that one of my students is going to talk about tomorrow, um, really talking about what happens when the block subsidy goes to zero. OK, so first of all, how do we think about uh, the cost of an attack? So you know, how do you value the cost of an attack? How do you put a number on that? And, and how do you, you know, think about all these different parameters? So when we're thinking about how much it might cost to conduct an attack, you know, a lot of people, when I've had informal conversations with them, kind of throw up their hands and are like, well, it's too hard. There's too much hash rate. You could never attack. But it's like, let's go a step beyond that, okay? Let's, let's actually think about how much it might cost. So that means you've got to do things like consider, well, how hard is it to actually set up a double spend? You know, um, make sure that, that, you know, I'm working with someone who doesn't know who I am. They can't come back and, and, and track me later. They can't just undo the USD payment or something like that. But certainly not impossible. Certainly possible to do this. Uh, you have to consider the cost of acquiring hash rate, whether that's building it or renting it or bribing existing miners. Always a possibility. Um, you know, there's, it's certainly not infinite. You know, if you showed up with a large enough pile of money on a, on a miner's doorstep, they would probably... They'd probably say, okay, sure, take the whole thing. Go ahead, conduct, conduct an attack if that amount is large enough. Um, you need to think about the operational cost of running the attack for however long you need to. That often comes up. Um, you might think about, well, you know, this was sort of Satoshi's argument. Well, you're, you're giving up block rewards in the future, and also you're losing maybe um, you know, something in the, you're, you're getting your rewards in Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin would probably decline. So you got to think about all these different things, right? So we're going to, we're going to think about all these different things. And it sounds really complicated, but the good news is you can kind of throw a lot of this behind parameters and still kind of get some interesting results, like still kind of get some sense of how to think about this. You also need to think about, well, how much is an attack worth, right? So first of all, there's the risk factor of the attack not succeeding. But you can account for that. We can put all of that you know, sort of in our equations. And you can think about, uh, and, and it's important to note that this isn't just one transaction. If someone does an attack, they can do many transactions. They can do potentially double spend many different, different actors. So you know, that, that's something to think about. An attacker is also getting the block rewards. Now, whether, how much that's worth depends on you know, how much Bitcoin 
um, you know, the price declines. But if you are thinking about the price declining, well then, there's also value to be made by shorting Bitcoin, and there are very large short markets. So you know, you've got to think about all of these different factors. This is kind of the preview. And what I'm trying to do here is hopefully convince you that, uh, you know, I'm not leaving out any of the major costs or sort of major values. Um, though if you think that I am, I'd, I'd love to hear that. So um, an important question is considering whether the cost should be modeled as flow or stock. So what does that mean? So flow costs are like an ongoing cost and stock is a one-time cost. So in the context of an attack on proof of work, Flow is, is when um, it might be the case that you can rent hash rate. So think about something like NiceHash, which just literally offers a rental market for hash rate. You can go on there, you can rent some hash rate for however long you want. The price might go up, uh, but you can do that. You know, there are limits to how much hash rate is available, but that's how you pay for the hash rate on NiceHash. Um, and the reason, um, and, the, and the conditions under which you can use a sort of flow model to consider cost is that the hash rate has use outside of the attack. So even if an attack occurs, whoever's got the hash rate can still rent it out to somebody else, you know, the next day. Um, or if the price of the coin, the thing that the hash rate is really good for, doesn't decline after the attack, then the hash rate's still going to be useful after the attack. You can still use it to mine on whatever coin um, was, uh, was attacked. So in order... Um, in order, to, you know, if something, something's flow, if it satisfies one of these two conditions. Um, and then the implication of that, the implication of using flow cost is that you, you don't really get to talk about the value of the hash rate equipment declining after the attack, because either you can use it to keep mining, the coin price didn't go down, or you can use it for something else. So there's alternatives. Now, the other way of thinking about the cost of an attack is the stock model. And this is probably the model that we're in for Bitcoin, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm, I'm telling you about both of them anyway, which is that you have specialized non-repurposable equipment. This equipment is only good for one thing, really, and that is mining on this chain, this one chain. And we think that after an attack, you can't keep using the equipment to mine on the chain profitably. So you need both of these things to be true, to be in the stock model. And if you're in the stock model, then that means that a decline um, that if there's an attack, you'd see a decline in the value of the hash rate or equipment after the attack. And so you can add this into your cost for the attack. So if you're in the flow model, um, you don't get to consider the decline of the hash rate or equipment, the value of it. And if you're in the stock model, you do. So these are kind of the two different worlds we're operating in. So just, you know, I know you're all probably thinking, well, duh, Bitcoin's in the stock model. So like, why are we even talking about flow? But just bear with me for a second. So um, some results from a very interesting paper by Eric Budish, where he like really gets into a lot of this, show that the flow model has a really high cost for security. In fact, sometimes that cost is uh, like you have to pay really high rewards. And in fact, sometimes it's profitable to just always attack. So the mo I'm going to briefly sort of share the way that he works this out. So you can sort of model the cost of hash rate per block. So if n is the amount of total hash rate in the system, and C is the cost of mining a block, then the hash rate cost per block is N times C. And then Budish makes this really nice observations that um, you know, if we're talking about a system with free entry where mining is permissionless, then there must be a zero profits condition um, that the cost of the hash rate must equal the reward that you get from mining. So what that means is that um, if it were the case, you get more of a reward for mining than how much it costs, then more people would join. Um, and if you get less, then more people would stop mining. And so the equilibrium, uh, theoretically, is where this is equal. Now, in practice, it's usually a little off from that, but um, it's useful as a model. And then the second really nice observation is that um, we need an incentive compatibility condition to deter the attack, meaning we need, we need p-block to be high enough that it costs a lot to do an attack. Okay, and connecting these, the results that he shows in the flow in the flow model are that a continuous payment to miners must be very large relative to the cost, rel relative to the value of a one-off attack. So how high do these rewards need to be to deter an attack? You know, I this math is all in his paper, and I've reproduced it here. And if there are mistakes, they're probably my own. But basically, um, you know. Don't, don't worry too much about the details here, but the intuition is that the attacker 
um, you know, needs some supermajority of hash rate. Uh, and uh, this is sort of like what that hash rate needs to look like. Um, and this is the cost on the left side of conducting an attack. They need more hash rate than the honest miners in the system. Um, and, but there might be some friction, some additional costs, which we model as F. And the benefit to the attacker of the attack is on the right side. And, that, um, and note here, they get both the attack, which is the value of the attack, whatever they're double spending, but they also get block rewards. So very important to know here that they also get the block rewards and the price might decline, and that is modeled by delta attack. So because an attack has happened, you know, they are getting the, um, the double spent money, and they are also getting block rewards, but that value will, might decline in real world terms because um, the price declines. So the safety condition we need to not make it, not have an incentive to attack, is that we need the reward. When you work this all out and you substitute in you know, P block for, for N times C, then you need the reward per block to be higher than this potential reward for an attacker. This is saying that in order for Satoshi's sort of hand wavy argument to be true, you need P block to be at least this much. Um, and so when you start to substitute in, you know, real-ish type numbers here, you realize P block needs to be really big compared to V attack. So if you want to secure a potential double spend transaction of like billions of dollars, you're gonna need to have like a really large ongoing block reward. And in fact, if there is no friction for the attacker and no price decline, there's actually no security either. And the intuition behind this is because the attacker gets the block rewards, which are roughly equal to the cost of their attack. So um, you really, really, really need uh, friction and a price decline or in the flow cost model, Nakamoto consensus is not secure at all. Um, so this was really nice sort of observation by Budish, and we did a bunch of work at the DCI a few years ago. There's a master student named James Lovejoy, and he built something called a reorg tracker. And he was running software for about 10 months that was monitoring 23 different chains, looking at proof of work chains at the time, um, looking for reorgs, and he detected a lot of reorgs. So the x-axis is time and the y-axis is reorg depth and um, on the, on the right-hand side of the y-axis is the, um, there were also double spends, was the amount that was double spent um, accumulating. And so, uh, you know, he, he did a lot of really nice work where he was tracking these double spend attacks um, and he was also looking at nice hash to look at rental costs and he was like trying to figure out who the addresses belong to and so, um, I don't have time to kind of go into all the details here, but you know, he might have some talks on YouTube on the internet, and also you can go to this URL and you can read about, um, you can read about his results and like see all the GitHub posts and things like that. So this was some really nice work that shows that, yeah, Budish's thing seems true, that you know, if, 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 it's, if it is the case, you can model, you know, these are all, these coins, BTG, LCC, EXP, these are all very low hash rate coins, but they were getting double spent a lot like many dozens of times. There were, there were many, many attacks. Um, something else that he noted was that asset prices rarely decreased post-attack. So um, people were monitoring all of these, you know, we were monitoring all these coins, these attacks were happening, and uh, what this shows is that most of the time the price didn't actually crash. So at least for this set of coins, at, you know, at this point in time, it doesn't seem like you can just assume that there will be a large price decrease and assume that that will save you from the results of our equation. They do not. Um, okay, so Bitcoin is probably stock, not flow. So that's the good news, is that they have to invest all of this money in buying these, this non-repurposable hardware. Um, and so we can use stock to model it instead of flow. So this is good because um, now we find that actually um, if you look at sort of the third line there, now um, you just need the hash rate to be bigger than the amount that you want to protect. Like if you assume that the price, but again, you need the price to go down. So, you know, if the price goes down like all the way to zero, so let's say there's an attack and the price goes down all the way to zero, then the amount that the attacker would lose would be the amount they needed to conduct the entire attack. That equipment would now be worth zero. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, you, you can protect against a very large attack, but this is really depending on price decline. If the price does not decline at all, then
then they can just keep happily mining. So you know you really need this. This uh, you really need this. And um, in the paper, you know, Budish derives well how much block reward do you need in this paradigm, and it's much more reasonable than in the flow model. It's more reasonable in the flow model. But um, like I said, the implication here is that security really depends on a decline in price after an attack. Uh, empirically, many coins that are granted very small that we've seen attacked have not actually had a price decline. Sometimes the price goes up. Uh, hopefully that's not what would happen in Bitcoin, but we need to know that, that these are the conditions under which Bitcoin is secure. If this does not happen, it is not secure. Um, and let's talk about a price decline. So um, the good news is the larger that the um, like the larger the price decline after an attack, the smaller the implicit attacks on the system to deter an attack. So what do I mean by tax on the system? I literally mean P block. P block is what we're paying in block subsidy and transaction fees. And um, we don't need to pay as much if there's sort of this threat hanging over the miners that your equipment will become useless after an attack. But unfortunately, this also implies that a sabotage attack is possible. Um, so we have to consider shorts as part of the value proposition of conducting an attack. And right now, just sort of like casually looking online, it looks like there's like about 20 billion in open interest in futures markets. I'm not sure how much that is specifically shorts, but we can probably anticipate this growing. So you have to kind of add this back in. The attacker could conduct an attack and at the same time take out a short. So that adds to the value that they could get from an attack. So unfortunately, we're in this world where if you rely on a decrease in price, to keep our sort of like the subsidy we have to pay for security low, then the coin is subject to sabotage attacks if there are short markets. If we assume that there won't be a decrease in price, we're basically back to the flow model. We're not in the stock model anymore because the equipment will still be usable after the attack. So this is not a great situation to be in exactly. So, okay, normally when I talk about this, I sort of get this response like, oh, there'll be this community response. Like, you know, if there was an attack, you know, one would just like let that go by. We'd all see it happening, attacks are in public, You'd, you would see, you know, like it would be very visible. You would see that this is happening. Um, so if there actually were a double spend attack, the community would rally around it to respond, they'd fork out the attacker in some way, and this means that the attack wouldn't succeed, and thus the attack is zero. Um, so, uh, you know, there's this sort of idea that there's no reward to be gotten, so why bother trying? You're just gonna lose the money that you spent trying to conduct an attack. So this still has some potential challenges. So first of all, it's still subject to sabotage attacks. So you could still, even if the attack is zero, you'd still get the money from the short if the price declined. Um, and I haven't really heard anything about how to exactly do this. So. Some people toss around this idea of hard forking out the specific proof of work algorithm. This is a terrible idea because this punishes the honest miners just as much as it punishes the attacker. And now you're definitely in the flow cost world. So that, that doesn't really work. I don't think that's not a good way. Um, you know, there's this idea of using um, Bitcoin Core has an RPC call called invalidate block where you can give it a block hash and say, I don't like that block. Don't accept any chain with that block on it. So you could theoretically do this to the attacker's um, double spend block. Um, but I don't know how many people know to do this <laughs> or, or how they think about it or you know, if there's really like a plan for how this should occur. And also this isn't an incentive compatibility argument. It requires extra protocol commitment to coordination. Um, and I think that you know, Bitcoin kind of prides itself on this sort of like honey badger, it's really hard to coordinate and get everybody to go along in the same direction and do the same thing. So, you know, I don't know if there's a credible commitment that this would work or that this would happen and there would need to be for this to be um, a good sort of defense. Um, so some of the work that we did at DCI was noticing that actually um, in Budish's work, he left out some interesting strategies. So Budish assumes that everyone except the attacker continues to follow heaviest chain. But why would you do that? Um, even if a heaviest chain comes along, if you've been double spent on that chain, I would not continue to follow that chain. I try to get my money back on the other chain. Um, so the victim has an interest to get their money back. Exchanges have reputation. If they're attacked, it doesn't look very good. 
community has an interest in maintaining stability and other miners want to be on a winning chain. So um, why would we assume that once an attacker chain appears out of nowhere, we're just all gonna go along with it and keep on mining on the attacker chain? No, maybe we would ignore heaviest chain for a bit and try to go back to the previous chain. And so this is the idea of a counterattack strategy. Um, it was formulated with um, Dan Morose and James Lovejoy and Dan Aronoff and David Parks. They were collaborators with me on this. Um, and the idea is that, okay, an attacker, so the top row is um, A is the attacker, D is the defender. So the attacker is conducting a double spend attack. They show a chain to the defender where the defender has the money, but in secret, they mine another chain. But the idea here is that the defender um, is incentivized to keep mining on the original chain. Um, and eventually that chain will be longer because they have more incentive to mine over there than the attacker does. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this, you can look at that URL, that's where the paper is. Um, something that I think is really fun and interesting is that we actually saw this happening in the wild. So this goes back to James's reorg detector. He was monitoring Bitcoin gold at the time and we actually saw a counterattack happen in the wild, like a multi-stage counterattack. Um, so that was very exciting to see that empirically that sort of thing might happen. Um, but I wanna note that right now, um, the current software we have for Bitcoin mines on the heaviest chain, um, not the chain where you have the most money or where you think you'll have the most money. So it might be worth considering a more rational way of choosing which chain to mine on. Um, I think that would be very complex. That would be very difficult uh, to continue sort of tracking that, but it's, it's, I think it's a really interesting future research direction. So um, we're kind of in this world, I think, um, where you kind of have to pick your security assumption for Bitcoin. So we didn't want to assume that a majority of the hash rate is honest, but I think you have to assume one of these four things, <laughs> and they all sort of have different types of implication. So first of all, you could assume that attacker friction is really, really high. Like it's just too hard to get hash rate. It's too hard to uh, participate in mining at that level. But the implication there is mining is not actually free entry, which means that it's not decentralized. And this also doesn't handle the idea that it's possible, it might be possible to bribe existing hash rate. Instead of that assumption, you could be like, no, I don't wanna make that assumption, fine then you could assume that there's gonna be a large price decline. Um, and if there's a large price decline and because we're in the stock model, things are probably okay. Uh, the problem there is that means that Bitcoin's subject to sabotage attacks and you should really watch the size of short markets uh, because someone could profit from something like that. Uh, you, might, you might assume that if this were to ever happen, the community would rally around it and do something, but this requires a credit credible commitment to fast coordination, and I, I don't really know, I don't know personally what that is. Um, and then you might think, okay, well maybe this counterattack strategy is interesting, um, but it requires implementation changes, and this is not actually vanilla heaviest chain Nakamoto consensus. This is a change to heaviest chain Nakamoto consensus. It's more like rational heaviest chain Nakamoto consensus or something like that. Um, so in, in my opinion, this is kind of sort of the status of things, which um, you know, I'm really interested in, in trying, to, trying to sort of make progress on, on formalizing this more. So looking forward, um, well, P block, super important. This is what's deterring attacks. Uh, currently that comes from transaction fees and a block subsidy. And just yesterday that block subsidy was halved and everything seemed to go great. It was very exciting. Um, uh, the problem here is that the block subsidy is going to keep having every four years. It's going to go to zero in 2140. And so we are rapidly moving towards a transaction fee only dynamic. Um, and miners might be incentivized to undercut, in this dynamic, miners might be incentivized to undercut and steal the previous block's transaction fees if there aren't enough high transaction fees in the mempool. This could lead to repeated forking and chain instability. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk about this problem right now. I'm gonna mention it and I'm gonna say that you should come to Claire Bow's talk tomorrow at 2.30. So she is a student working with Tajani and um, uh, there was a paper in 2016 out of Princeton which um, for, you know, formulated this problem and defined the undercutting strategy. And they found that um, in the sort of parameter space that they investigated, Bitcoin was very unsafe. 
but um, Claire has extended that work as part of her master's thesis, so you'll have to come to her talk tomorrow to find out if under a different type of parameter space whether or not Bitcoin is safe. So in conclusion, um, I think we need better arguments for when Bitcoin is economically secure and when it's not. We need to formalize this folklore of a community response. We need to understand better transaction fee dynamics. Um, and I think that there's still a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of great work already, but monitoring, especially even other chains, just to get, and mining, um, to get more empirical data. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much. And I think um, maybe we have a few minutes for questions. Okay, okay yeah. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, how would Ethereum-style slashing fit into this analysis? Yeah, um, so that's um, some kind of work that's in progress with some other collaborators who might be in this audience. Um, I don't think we're ready to share anything there yet, but I think um, that is a that's uh, an interesting question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I have two questions. Uh, when you talk about the analysis of the reorgs, um, why are you assuming every reorg was an attack? Is there a reason why you're assuming every reorg is an attack? Because you said there was no price decline, but it might just be a natural reorg. And second question, is there any analysis about non-51% attack scenarios where someone has 30, 40%? Because it, I think then the probability of succeeding in the attack is gonna drop drastically. Yeah, I'll answer your second question first. We didn't really look at, um, we didn't monitor for or look for uh, 30 to 40% like Attacks. Like, I mean, we did monitor and collect data on orphans. So you would have seen, you know, if someone was trying to do something with less hash rate, you would have seen like the orphan rate uptick. Um, I mean, this was a few years ago, and we're not still collecting this data, but that would be a really interesting thing to analyze. Um, I'm not assuming every reorg is an attack, though. I think every reorg could be considered an attack if, if you, because you're taking block rewards from the original miners. Um, but what we had in um, in this, uh, let me find the graph right here. Um, so I don't know if you can see like the depth here, but these are all like, these are all like, like sometimes it, it, it gets up to like 25, like these are block hours. So these are like hours of blocks reorg. So this is normalized for different block times, okay? So this isn't number of blocks, this is like time reorg. So this is a pretty weird thing to happen. Like this is not normal for many hours of blocks to just get reorg. <clears throat> so you you had mentioned that uh, you don't or you have a suspicion around something like invalidate block being used as a like credible response uh, because like Bitcoin has this like honey badger resistance to change. My question is, doesn't the existence of relatively recent soft fork consensus changes point to the fact that we can actually get community consensus around things and that if we can get it for something as like unnecessary, as something like a feature upgrade for new SegWit versions, that we could more easily get it for things that are an existential threat to Bitcoin itself. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I worry about an attacker trying to create um, something that splits the community, like double spending some people on one side and other people on another side. Like you, they could create many chains, right? Like it really might not be, and I haven't really thought very deeply about this yet, but I think it's worth thinking about. Like what, like, you know, kind of getting creative around if you're an attacker, how would you try to split the community by incentivizing them to want different forks, right? But by by forking it multiple times, they actually yeah. increase the cost of attack linearly it with does the increase number the, of It forks, does increase right? the cost of attack linearly, but if it makes the community so confused that they can no longer sort of resolve the attack, maybe it's worth it. I don't know. I'm not saying that I have the answer here. Yeah, I'm saying no, that it's fair. like worth considering that, that it might be possible to split the community on, especially if there were a partition in the network and you took advantage of that for a little while or something, like really, who, which one's the canonical chain, right? You might cause confusion in that realm. Um, actually, the thing that makes me feel most hopeful is not the consensus around soft forks, but what happened with um, UASF and SegWit2x. So that was actually the community kind of saying, even if you did SegWit2x, we would ignore it, and kind of building credibility around that. That, I think, what, to me, is sort of the most promising kind of sort of evidence of community coordination. It not that different though because the 2x scenario was a hard fork and so inaction was to, uh, w would imply a rejection whereas in this case inaction would still follow heaviest chain? Uh, 
that's a good question. I don't know. I would have to think about this further. But I think that was an example where the community kind of got together and said, um, you know, don't even bother trying. Even though you have such a huge percentage of the hash rate behind you, don't even bother trying. Like a relatively small part of the community. And they were able to like be credible about that and convince a very large portion of the hash rate not to bother. But I, I'm happy to talk more about that offline. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, afternoon everyone. My name is Carla. I am very fortunate to work at Chaincode Labs in New York City on Lightning protocol development. And today I'm going to be talking about upgrading Lightning. I'm not going to be talking about channel jamming. I talk about channel jamming all the time. Um, so I'm going to be talking about something different today. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I want to talk about upgrading Lightning because I think that this is something that people don't really talk about much. They really know how we go about making changes to this decentralized and already deployed payments network that people are using every day. Um, I sometimes think that we're sort of flying on a plane, we're clinging to the sides, and we're trying to change things in the wings without the whole thing going down. Uh, so I want to talk. <clears throat> excuse me. I want to talk a bit about the mechanics of how this actually works under the hood and walk you through some of the protocol nuts and bolts that we use to do this. So I'm sure that almost everyone here is familiar with the difference between Bitcoin and Lightning as pieces of software. They aim to achieve different things, but perhaps less familiar with how the development of these protocols and the upgrade of these protocols happens under the hood. I think in Bitcoin, we're more exposed to these. We think about soft forks, we think about activation, but Lightning is a pretty inherently different piece of software, so the way that we go about changing it is different to Bitcoin. But still interesting, perhaps a little bit less controversial. And to talk about this, I want to talk about the origin of how these protocols came to be and the way that we go about developing them today. So as I'm sure you're all well familiar, Bitcoin was released with the white paper, which is a great succinct overview of how this system is supposed to work and with a reference implementation from Satoshi, which provided the code for this whole protocol. But what's really interesting about Bitcoin is that it started as a code base. It didn't start as a protocol. It didn't start with the definition of how these things work. So that code base now is the Bitcoin protocol, because whatever Bitcoin was doing when it was written is now what we all do. And a great example of this, of one of the Satoshi bugs that we live with today, is that Bitcoin's consensus consensus engine has an off by one bug that just existed since the beginning of time. And now if you want to go and implement the Bitcoin protocol, you have to write that off by one bug into your software to be compatible with today's network. Uh, and today we know this software as Bitcoin Core. It's pretty different to what Satoshi originally uh, released thanks to the work of some very dedicated Bitcoin Core devs. But we still don't really have a protocol that defines the messages, the interactions, and the way that this Bitcoin protocol works. So we do have a repo called the BIFS, and this is where we write up uh, the details of large changes to Bitcoin. So we outline what we want to do, and then we go ahead with implementing it. But it's nothing close to sort of a specification where we go into the messages and the, and the interactions. So even though we do have these alternate implementations like BTCD, which is written in Go, and Bitcoin Knots, which is a fork of Bitcoin, if you want to understand how the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer layer works, how we send messages to each other, you look at the Bitcoin Core code base because that code is the protocol. Now, Lightning's quite different because Lightning started out with a research paper, but not with code itself. And when people decided they were interested in taking this paper and turning it into an implementation, they first started out with writing a formal specification for Lightning. So these are called the BOLTs, the basis of Lightning technology specification. And they are an RFC where we describe the messages and the interactions and the ways that you have to behave to work with the Lightning Network. And in theory, anyone can go and read through these documents and code up everything that they describe, and they can produce a valid specification-compliant Lightning node. And it turns out lots of people have done this. So we have LND, Core Lightning, LDK, and Async, which are all implementations of this specification. So you can, in theory, write one of these impl implementations without looking at anyone else's code. So it's just a different process. It has a different origin to Bitcoin. I'm not saying one is better or worse. I just want to point out that they're different. Because we have this difference in the way that we go about writing and implementing our protocol, we also have a difference in the way that we go about upgrading it. 
So Lightning is very different from Bitcoin in a few ways. One is the history. The other one is, of course, that we do not have a critical consensus layer, right? We rely on Bitcoin's consensus layer to give us our source of truth. And Lightning is really, you can think of it as a consensus of two, right? We have people, they create a channel, which is a contract between the two of them. And then they need to speak the same language to be able to interact with this protocol. And then we have sort of a routing layer on top, which everyone has a shared understanding of how that works. Now, as I've also mentioned, this is specification driven. So whenever you want to make a change to Lightning, you will first, well, you'll probably implement it a bit to see if it works, but you will first go to the specification, write up the messages you're adding, write up the interactions that you expect with these messages and define the entire protocol. You will then go about the task of implementing this in your implementation and trying to convince other people to do the same. And a key piece uh, where being specification driven uh, sets us apart from Bitcoin is that we have much stricter interoperability requirements. So Bitcoin needs to be interoperable with all itself and all its previous versions. But Lightning implementations, because we have one specification and many implementations, we have to be interoperable with ourselves, with all our previous versions, with everyone else's implementation and all their previous versions. And this is really where Lightning development gets very nasty. If anyone here has done a protocol change, they know is it's incredibly difficult to write something in the specification that is specific enough, has no ambiguity, and doesn't leave anything out. And it's a big problem if you do leave these things out or have an incomplete spec, because if two different people interpret the specification differently, they can go ahead and ship code which doesn't actually work with each other, and the Lightning Network is at risk of fragmenting. And for a, network, a payments network where things flow through the network, a split in the Lightning Network, while not as critical as a consensus bug, is certainly something that would crash the plane pretty quickly. So in our spec process, we have a requirement that you have to, once you've written the spec, you have to get at least two implementations to test that new feature and achieve interoperability before we merge to the spec. And this is really the piece of the development and the protocol task where you will spend a lot of time refining and making things better. Because when you implemented it, it seemed perfect, but it turns out you left all this information in your head, which no one else knows. So it's very difficult to reach that interrupt phase. And then finally, we are a protocol that is feature bit gated. This is how we manage forwards and backwards compatibility. And I'm going to talk about it in great detail in the rest of the talk, because I, I love this piece of lightning. And it doesn't get enough shine, which is why I'm talking about it today. So how do we go about upgrading this network? How do we change the plane while we are currently flying it? We have this wonderful rule and life philosophy in Lightning that it's OK to be odd. This is a formal rule in our specification. And what it means is that if you are a Lightning node and you receive a message or a field or a feature that is an odd number, so it's a 1, it's a 3, it's a 5, and you don't know what it is because your software doesn't support that feature, it's all right for you to proceed with the interaction that you're currently dealing with because it's OK to be odd. Someone's letting you know, hey, I understand this message, I understand this feature, but if you don't, it's OK, it's not a big deal. By contrast, if you receive a message, a feature, or a field that is even and you don't understand it, that is what we call a required feature or message or field. And if you receive that, it is your responsibility to terminate that connection because they've required something They've sent you an even message, so it's not OK if you don't understand it. And you are not compatible with that node, with that feature. Right. And the way that we think about this in terms of network-wide upgrades is we use a feature bit vector. So it's just a bit vector. Many of you are looking at this, and you're probably thinking about interpreting it as a number. But a bit vector is just a set of bits where we start on the far end, and we number each bit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we look at the value of each bit independently to infer some sort of meaning. And in the case of features, is a 0 means this feature is not enabled, and a 1 means that this feature is. But in Lightning, we also want to be able to say, is it odd or even? Is it, it's OK if you don't understand this feature, or you have to understand this feature, or you should hang up on me. So we also break, it, break down our feature, bit into, our feature vector into pairs. So each two bits here represent a different feature that the network uh, is working on. And when you roll out features and you propose upgrades, you'll pick a new pair and a new position in this vector, and you'll use that to represent your new feature. 
Now, within this feature bit pair, we also look at the odd and the even values. So we use the bit position to decide whether something is even or odd. So this first bit here is in the zeroth position. So if that is set, we interpret the feature as being required. The second one here in the pair is the optional field because it's the first bit, it's, it's the odd one and it's okay to be odd. And then so on, it goes even odd, even odd as, those, as it works. Uh, so for every single feature pair, we have these two representations of the ways that we can turn the feature on. So stepping back to look at those original three pairs that I was talking about, features A, B, and C. The first feature is optional because the odd bit is set. The second feature is not supported at all by this feature bit because it's both zeros. And the final one is required because the even bit is set, meaning you have to be able to understand this. And we use these feature vectors all over the protocol to make sure that we remain interoperable and we are able to talk to our neighbors. The first place where we use this is in the init message. So this is the first message in our handshake with our peer. When we connect to them and we say, hi, hello, this is me. These are the features I, I support. Provided you understand all of the even features, you can proceed. But if someone sends you an even feature that you don't understand, you're actually responsible for hanging up that connection because something could go wrong if you proceed because you have different views of the feature set of the protocol. We also use them in node and channel announcements. So these are messages that our node will create and will gossip to the rest of the network. And it has the purpose of telling people about our node and the features that we support. So maybe someone wants to connect to us and open up a channel and they want to see that we support nice fancy taproot channels. So that's compelling to them. And channel announcements, we announce to the graphs that people can route through us. So we have various features to do with the way in which we send payments, and these channel announcements tell people what type of payments to send through our node. And then finally, we also put these features in invoices. So that's the QR code that you all grumble so much about in Lightning, where if you want to get paid, you create an invoice and you encode information in it, and one of the pieces of the, in this information is a feature bit that tells you, you can use this feature if you pay me, you can use that feature if you pay me. And in all of these cases, if you receive even an invoice, maybe some of you had this quite frustrating experience, if you receive an invoice and you can't scan it, it may be because your node doesn't understand the same feature set as the, as the invoice generating one. So how do we actually go about using these fancy feature bits when we want to upgrade the network? So say we have some feature C, we've upgraded the specification, we've reviewed it, we've tested it, we've got interoperability, now it's time to roll that feature out in the network. Someone has to go first. So if this blue node upgrades their software to the new version, they will now start to advertise the feature, but it's optional. They'll say, hey, I understand this feature, but I'm not gonna, you know, if you don't understand it, it's totally okay. And it's fine, all of its Yalu peers are still able to connect to it. They essentially just ignore that it supports feature C because they don't know what it is, and it can go about its operation as usual. And this will happen over time, nodes will start to upgrade. Generally in Lightning, it takes about six months to a year to get people sort of upgraded, or we have a CVE and then everyone upgrades very fast. Um, but so long as you're not connected to nodes that use this feature, you won't yet be able to use it uh, until you get one of your peers that also advertises the same optional feature bit. And then these two blue nodes can start to use the feature because they both know that they speak the same language. And over time, we'll eventually be able to observe, at least for network level features, that everyone is upgraded and they understand this new way of, of talking to each other, essentially. Um, we're not able to see the features of nodes that are unannounced. So in Lightning, if you are running a mobile node, you often won't announce your channel because you just want them for your own use. And in this case, we won't be able to see what feature set they have. So we, keep, we play it safe and just give people a reasonable amount of time to upgrade. Uh, we also, you know, can go and check out the LSP, the software, and see what, what version everyone is running to understand what their feature bits are. And the final step in this is to make the, move, make the transition from an optional feature bit to a required feature bit. And when C eventually turns this on, because we've observed that the entire network is upgraded and it's safe to do so, even though they require this feature bit, all of their neighbors already understand this, this new feature C, so they can go about their business. It's totally fine. I'd like to point out that if one of their neighbors isn't upgraded, they'll actually disconnect from the, the dark blue node when they advertise this feature because they don't understand this new feature C. So 
this is an important piece because we can't turn this on until everyone is upgraded. And in the past, we've accidentally turned it on and had to roll it back in case we didn't see the full network being uh, totally upgraded to a new feature. And then in time, we'll have everyone in the required set. And we haven't done this much, but I think that we're going to do it soon. Uh, is we can actually then sunset that feature. We no longer need to advertise something if we know everyone supports it, and we can reclaim the feature bit. And that's kind of important because these feature vectors can get quite big, so it is nice to be able to take back some of the lower values and reuse them for things that, you know, for new features, and we can just assume the existing feature set to be part of the base protocol, so to speak. Right, the last thing I want to talk about is the different types of updates, because this is also something that's pretty unique to Lightning, and it's not something that we see in Bitcoin. And this is that depending on the type of upgrade you're looking at, the amount of time between the update being deployed and you being able to use it will vary. And that's because unlike Bitcoin, we have quite different roles in Lightning. We have sending nodes who are responsible for pathfinding and creating onion packets and sending their payments through the network. We have relaying nodes who need to forward these packets on behalf of the sender in exchange for fees. And we have receiving nodes who receive all of that and are responsible for settling the payment back through the network. And depending on the content of the feature itself, we may need one or all of these roles to be upgraded to be able to take advantage of the new feature. So <clears throat> the first feature I like to talk about is something, or type of feature upgrade I'd like to talk about, is something that I call a pairwise feature update. And I made that word up, so if someone has a better one, I welcome you to tell me. Uh, but this is an upgrade where you only need the two active participants in a, in a feature use to be upgraded, right? So you can think sender and receiver, you can think channel peers, you don't need everyone to support this, you just need the people actively doing something to be able to to understand this new feature. And a great example of this is something called MPP, or multi-part payments, which is something we rolled out way back in sort of 2019, I think, which is the ability to pay a single invoice with multiple HTLCs, which is the contract we use to forward payments through Lightning. And this is a really nice upgrade to the network at the time, because being able to break payments up into smaller pieces allows us to get around some of the liquidity constraints that Lightning often runs into. So if you wanted to use this feature back in 2019 when it was just rolling out on the network, all you needed is for the sender to signal that they understand this new way of operating and for the receiver to know that they understand to be upgraded to use the feature. And then the receiver can go ahead and forward payments through the network with as many HTLCs as they want, right? No one making the forwarding these payments needs to know that they're part of one payment. It's not relevant to the forwarding nodes. But when you get to the receiving node, they need to receive all of these multiple HTLCs and settle them. Because if the receiver wasn't updated to understand this, they'd receive one HTLC, they'd see that it's too little money for what they were expect expecting, and they'd fail it back and say, no, this is not correct. So with a pairwise update, you only need the participating parties to be upgraded. And generally, it's a lot quicker to get an update like this out because you don't need the whole network to be supporting it. You can sort of start using it uh, before everyone's ready, which is really nice. Um, the second type of upgrade is the opposite of this. It's a full path upgrade. So this is when both the sender, the receiver, and the forwarding nodes need to be upgraded for you to be able to use the feature. And a great example of this one is if we were to upgrade the Lightning Network from hash time lock contracts to point time lock contracts. So this is a, an extension we hope to make in the future. And this changes the way in which we forward payments at every single hop. And in this case, you do need the intermediate nodes to be able to understand this protocol because they need to handle this new flow of settling payments with points rather than pre-images. So when you, when you want to make a payment with PTLCs, you will have to forward it onwards and every single hop in the path needs to understand it as well as the recipient so that the full flow is able to use the feature. And generally, when we make upgrades like this, in the past, we changed the structure of our payment packet structure. So the thing we forward to each node, we made it a bit more flexible. And what we'll do is we'll just do pathfinding as normal. We'll take a look at the path that we've selected, and then we'll optimistically use the feature if available along the whole path. Otherwise, we'll just fall back to the legacy thing. Because generally, these can take longer. So even if in the beginning, when people are upgraded, you don't get to use it straight away, 
eventually over time, the network will automatically roll over to the new feature. So these are sort of the two ways that I think about these, pairwise, which is much quicker, full path, which really takes a bit of time. And I put a few uh, of our current protocol upgrades, this is not really working, um, here to sort of categorize them. What I think is interesting, particularly, is that taproot channels are a pairwise upgrade because you and your channel party speak the language of taproot channels in order to be able to create one. And no one else needs to know that you're running a taproot channel, it doesn't matter to them. But taproot gossip, which is the second piece of the puzzle to be able to use taproot channels for routing payments, is a full path upgrade because we define this new message and you need the entire network to be able to propagate it for this to be useful. So it's interesting kind of how those shake out. And there's various other things, onion messages for offers, which need to flow through the whole network and PTLCs that I've already spoken about. So I hope this is vaguely interesting to you and that you learned something. If you didn't, I hope you reveled in your love of feature bits like me. Uh, at Chaincode, we have some great resources about the Lightning Network. We have a self-paced curriculum if you want to go and read through that. It's got a lot of great and interesting protocol work in it. And then if you're a researcher and you're interested in the problems that we think about with Bitcoin and Lightning, Chaincode also has a Bitcoin research prize. So please give that a scan, nominate your favorite paper, or even perhaps think about writing one yourself. Um, but that's all I've got. Thank you so much. That was awesome and interesting. Taking a step back, um, how, how well would you say that Lightning Network works today, given your goals for it, and how easy is it to use? Um, given my goals for it, I okay. have less ambitious goals for Bitcoin and Lightning than most people. I think that if they're useful technologies for people who need them today, that's a success for me, and anything else is extra. So for me, both Bitcoin and Lightning, like they're usable. They help people use payments in a way that is freeing and open. And so I like compared, I mean, I've been doing this for like five years compared to where we were in 2019. I can't believe how much better everything is. Um, in terms of how easy is Lightning to use, that's a spectrum, right? Like how easy is Lightning to use with what uh, custodial to, setup? Custodial Lightning is a breeze and it's seamless. Running your own node in your Raspberry Pi is still difficult, right? There's a lot of active management that I haven't really seen like companies or solutions okay. pop up to just say like click me a button run me a lightning node in a self-custodial mm -hmm. way and have everything okay. just work um that's a very difficult piece of the owl to complete uh but yeah i think that uh, there's a lot of really good semi-custodial well not semi-custodial non-custodial semi-trusted solutions yeah. coming yeah. out with like mm -hmm. the advent of the lsp spec so like a specification for mobile phones so they can all have the same way of operating just like we have a specification and I think that really helps manage the trust trade-off because you can now move between mobile lightning providers or LSPs which is very powerful because then if someone misbehaves you can just move right now you have to close out get your funds and it's very it's sort of very tiresome so I'm optimistic about it I think payment failures are way down which is great and it's just sort of putting the polish on it and continuing to improve the protocol, which channel jamming, we also definitely need to fix, but we're working on it. Go. How are you well. doing? I, I wanted to ask, I'm building a solution for small businesses to get uh, factoring or microfinance tools for like microfactoring kind of thing. If I use Lightning Network I and, like and, I, and I connect the, the features that you guys are developing on, is that something that that it could be really uh, uh, like on the invoices? Can I can I use the timestamp on the invoices to better perhaps make sure that these businesses providing these invoices are or unpaid invoices? Do you think is it better for me to use Lightning Network on in the way that you're showing it, or just on chain on the regular? BTC core named the network. I think that Lightning has a few advantages over Bitcoin, like particularly oh, yeah. topical right now is that the fees in the base chain can be mad, especially when that stuff, stuff like the halving happens. But I really like the feature set that invoices give you, right? So there's all sorts of things. The invoice is signed by your key when you create it. So you can cryptographically prove that someone created this invoice with their known pub key. 
You can add like metadata to it. You can add fields. Once it's paid, you have cryptographic proof that that payment has occurred, right? The pre-image proves that you made the payment. And I used to work in an exchange. It was my first job. And I think where Lightning really shines is for failures and timeouts. So if you do on-chain and something goes wrong, you know, if it doesn't confirm in time and then the, price, the USD price changes, you have to issue a refund on-chain. It's like kind of a hack compared to Lightning where the payment will go quickly and it, so you don't have as much USD risk and it'll fail back instantly. So you don't have to manually issue that refund, which is really nice. That said, as that question alluded to, Lightning can be tricky to set up in a totally non custodial way. The, the settlement will be better on the Lightning that we're using the channels? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's instant settlement. Uh, when it works, it works, but it doesn't, less so. But refunds are better, speed is better, fees are generally lower, though not always. Thank you. Thank you.